Yes, guys. So what do you understand about the standard India S105? India S105 is predominantly broken down into two parts. The first part of the standard, which deals with non-current assets held for sale. And the second part of the standard, which deals with discontinued operation. Now, I have to deal with both parts in a distinguished manner because both of them have a very little things in common. Since discontinued operation is a pretty a very, very small standard, they had to be clubbed into some relevant standard. So which happens to be your India S105. Now, if you look at the comparable standard in your accounting standard, it was AS24, which was talking about discontinuing operations. Guys, though it's a significant change, there it was discontinuing operation. That means over the period of discontinuance, the standard had a relevance. It had a relevance over the period of discontinuance because you need to understand just because I want to discontinue my operations next day, I, I just shut down my office and the operations are discontinued does not happen. Let's I understand a manufacturing operation today had to be discontinued. There are significant things which happen because before you shut down, there are some materials which have to be disposed of. There are some creditors which have to be paid off. There are some debtors which have to be collected. There's a factory shed which has to be dismantled. There's a lease which has to be cancelled. So many things happen as far as your discontinued operation is concerned. Therefore, it cannot be considered as a one day activity. So AS24 was talking about discontinuing operation where it had a relevance of basically uh, reporting or presenting or disclosing events throughout the period of discontinuance. But if you look at India S105, they have cut short the standard or basically reduce the importance of the standard by calling it as discontinued operation. That means he's only talking about after the discontinuance, what are the necessary things that should be done. While the first part of the standard is a complete new thing. Non-current assets held for sale has never been discussed as a part of your accounting standards or your IGAP. It is your INDIAS which is bringing on this new concept of INDIAS 105 talking about non-current assets held for sale. Understandably, why did this standard even come up? Now, the standard comes out because you need to understand that a few assets in the organization might be held for sale. For example, a reason for a new asset has been replacing the old asset. The old asset is no longer being used, has to be discontinued or has to be disposed of. Or a particular manufacturing equipment used for a particular product, that particular product is discontinued. So this asset which was manufacturing the product is no longer of any relevance. Therefore has to be held for sale. Now, why should we have a different standard for this? We should have a different standard for this because number one, I have a problem with the measurement. I cannot apply the same cost approach or revaluation approach as we have discussed under India 16, 38 or 40, even for this non-current asset held for sale. Because there, there is a going concern that means that particular asset is being used for over a period of time. But here you have an intention to dispose the asset. So you cannot have the same intention or the same measurement pattern. Presentation. If I talk about my fixed assets or my assets which are under operations, I should have a clear distinguishment between the assets which I am using today and the assets which I want to dispose today. Because if I calculate my return on fixed assets, my net profit divided by operating assets, your operating assets should exclude such kind of assets which are held for disposal. So that is the second reason of presentation requirement where it requires you to basically pull out these assets from the normal categorization, put them under a different category called as non-current assets held for sale. So any asset either recognized under India's 16 property plan and equipment or recognized under India's 38 intangible asset or recognized as investment property under India's 40. If the intention of the management is not to use the asset or continue to use the asset, but the intention of the management is to collect money from uh, proceeds from the sale of the asset, then I'll have to categorize it separately as non-current asset held for sale. Clear? Now, when I say non-current asset, the first question that comes up, first of all, what is a non-current asset? How do I identify whether it is a current asset or a non-current asset? 
then you will have to go back to the definition given under AS1. Your Inde AS1, which is presentation of financial statements, gives you certain definitions. And one such definition is regarding your non-current asset as well. In simple sense, non-current asset can be defined as other than current asset or story cut. It is simply other than current assets. When I say other than current asset, one has to understand, first of all, what am I indicating towards? Anything other than current asset, then first of all, I should know what is a current asset. Without knowing what is a current asset, it is impossible to understand or have a knowledge of what is a non-current asset. So let's see what current assets are defined under India's one. Your India's one defines current assets by breaking them into three categories. There are particularly three categories into which it breaks it down. First one, cash and cash equivalents are current assets. Cash and cash equivalents is nothing but cash balance, cash in bank or any other deposits which are which have a maturity date of less than 60 days. They are called as cash and cash equivalent. Second one, assets that are expected to be realized, consumed, sold within an operating cycle. I'm saying assets which are expected to be realized, consumed, sold within an operating cycle. What is an operating cycle? Operating cycle means in simple sense, the time which is taken from the day that you procure the raw material up to realizing the money from the customer. What is the process under this? The life cycle that goes under this is first to purchase the raw material from the supplier, bring the raw material to the factory premises, manufacture whatever the finished goods are, sell the finished goods to the customer, realize the money from the customer and that is say one operating cycle. Now operating cycles differ from organization to organization. Look at retail industry like uh, Ratnadeep supermarkets. What happens with Ratnadeep supermarket? You need to understand that the operating cycle is very small because they cannot hold the inventory for a pretty long time. Every day in day out customer keeps walking in and the inventory keeps on getting sold out. So that means the operating cycle of such kind of DMARTs or Ratnadeeps are generally quite small. But if you look at a manufacturing entity, or you talk about a real estate entity, then the operating cycle is much beyond 12 months, much beyond 12 months. But however, for the purpose of simplicity, he says, you can consider an operating cycle as exactly 12 months. You can consider for simplicity sake, an operating cycle as within 12 months or less than 12 months, unless or until you have a reason to believe that your operating cycle is more than 12 months. Like I told you, real estate entities, have an operating cycle of definitely more than 12 months. So such kind of enterprises can take an operating cycle of more than 12 months. In another, in any other case, normally the entities should consider an operating cycle as within a period of 12 months. An asset which gets consumed, realized or sold within an operating cycle. Debtors expected to be collected within a period of next 12 months. Inventory expected to be sold within the next 12 months. Raw material expected to be consumed in the process of production within the next 12 months. This way, if you understand, you can say that all these will categorize as current assets because they are assets which are expected to be realized, consumed or sold within a period of 12 months or an operating cycle. Third one, assets held solely for the purpose of trade. That means I am purchasing that particular asset only with an intention to sell that asset and realize some profit. Now that could happen either in the case of your inventory also because a few inventory you just buy and you just sell. That is an intention to trade. You also have an intention to trade even for your invent uh, your securities as well like equity shares and de debt but they don't get covered here. They should be covered under the standard of India's 109. So in essence, I'm saying a non-current asset is an asset which is other than a current asset and current assets defined under India S1 is basically broken down into three parts. First one, cash and cash equivalents. Second one, assets expected to be realized, consumed and sold within the period of an operating cycle that is considered as 12 months. Third one, assets which are acquired solely for the purpose of trade. So these are the three parts which you can categorize as current assets. So anything other than these assets should be considered as a non-current asset. 
when do you call a non current asset is held for sale held for sale is a management intention it is the intention of the management to either use an asset in the process of production or to hold it for disposal it's a pure management intention so there he says an asset is held for sale if an entity expects to recover the carrying value of the asset from the sale of the asset rather than from continuing use of the asset so i'm saying if an entity intends to recover the carrying value of the asset from the sale of the asset rather than from continuing use of the asset in such cases we call that non current asset as held for sale similar sounding we got in when we were discussing about india's 36 impairment if you remember there i said if an entity intends to recover the carrying value of the asset from the sale of the asset rather from continuing use of the asset then recoverable amount should be your net selling price which is fair value minus cost to sell that same sounding i am getting again here i am saying a non current asset should be classified as held for sale if an entity intends to recover the carrying value of the asset from the sale of the asset rather than from continuing use of the asset then you can call such non current asset as held for sale arises due to various reasons i discontinued a particular product the manufacturing equipment of that particular product is held for sale on today's date because you don't have an intention to use that asset anymore i am basically relocating from one place to the other so the existing equipment at this place is intended for sale or intended for disposal or <clears throat> let's say you have replaced uh, replaced an asset with another asset of higher efficiency then the earlier asset which i own is held for sale so multiple ways or multiple reasons could happen for the purpose of holding an asset as held for sale now let's go on. now for me to classify an asset as held for sale it should meet two criteria the first criteria is that the asset is held for sale immediately in the present condition i'm saying an asset is held for sale immediately in present condition what do you mean by this immediately in present condition what do you mean by this very tricky word right let's say for example i have a vehicle four wheeler vehicle i own i purchased a new vehicle and this earlier vehicle i am no longer using it but i am saying there are certain repairs to that vehicle the repair to the vehicle has to be performed before i intend to sell the vehicle so i'm saying if i sell it like that no one will buy so let me repair the vehicle a little it will take a good 15 to 20 days time and that is when i will intend to sell the asset so in such cases this condition is not satisfied because the car is not held for sale immediately in present condition you are expecting to perform certain action on that particular vehicle or repairs on that particular vehicle before the vehicle is actually disposed of or before the vehicle is intended to be disposed of therefore this condition is not expected to be met if you look at he is very clearly using the word immediately in present condition if the sale is expected to occur in near future i am no longer using this asset and i am intending to sell it in the coming 12 months not possible to be classified as held for sale because you are saying it is in near future you never said immediately in present condition so immediately in present condition has to be taken in literal sense in literal sense that means this asset as on today's date you walk in you take this asset and you leave that is held for sale in in present condition so that's why the first point to explain this part he says if an asset is held for sale in near future it cannot be classified as non current asset held for sale now let's say there is an ongoing manufacturing process okay there is an ongoing manufacturing process i have given a huge advertisement on the newspaper saying that one particular machine with me is actually held for sale buyer walks into the premises and he asks me where is the machine which you want to sell i showed him the machine is already running 
He said the machine is already running. How can you say you want to sell this? He said, if you want it, I'll pack it right now and I'll sell it to you. Can I call it as held for sale? He says the answer is no. Because the, if the asset is vitally used in an ongoing production process, if an asset is vitally used in an ongoing production process, then it cannot be considered as held for sale in present condition unless the in management intends to sell along with the ongoing order. That means I am packing a particular finished good and this packing machine is the one which I am holding for sale. Buyer walks into the premises and he questions, why are you using this asset? I said, there is a packing contract which I got. Now, if you buy that particular machinery, then I will not just sell the machinery, but also the contract is yours. So that means when it is vitally used in an ongoing process, it cannot be classified as held for sale. But if in case I intend to sell the machine along with the ongoing order for which it is vitally used on today's date, then you can classify that particular asset as held for sale immediately in present condition. Here. Now, sometimes there is a delay, right? Immediate sale, immediate sale, immediate sale. What immediate sale? You think if I have a piece of land, you think there can be an immediate sale? It is not possible. I first advertise, uh, plenty of buyers will walk in, plenty of agents will walk in, walk in. Those agents will introduce certain customers to me. Certain customers will directly reach to me. There is a set of negotiation which go on. There's a particular price which we ascertain. Finally, he says, I'll give you a certain advance but the sale will be completed only after three months or six months. There is so much of process is involved. That's why he's saying sometimes there could be a delay in sale. Sometimes there could be a delay in sale. But in this case of a land which I gave you, the delay in sale is customary to the nature of the asset. The asset is of such nature that you cannot sell it immediately. Let's say I have this mobile phone. Immediately I go to the showroom and I'll say, I don't want this mobile phone. Take it off. He gave me 10,000 rupees and he asked me to go. So here the sale happened immediately. But in every asset, the sale may not happen immediately. Sometimes the delay is customary to the nature of the product and the nature of the process of sale. Look at how the land gets sold. First, there is an advance. There is an agreement to sale which happens. Then looking at this agreement to sale, the buyer goes to the bank applies for a loan, loan gets disbursed into the uh, seller's account. Then you go to the registrar's office, submit all the documents. Then the transfer of title happens into his name. So much of process is involved. So that means immediate sale may not be possible by the nature of the asset. Sometimes the nature of the asset and the nature of sale are in such a way that there could be a delay. Such a delay can be ignored in classifying an asset as held for sale if it is customary to the process of sale. It is customary. Normally sale happens like this only. So there is an evident say, delay as far as the sale is concerned because of the nature of the asset and because of the nature in which I want to sell the asset. Therefore, such kind of delays can be ignored in classifying an asset as held for sale. So this is the first criteria to be, to be satisfied for me to classify a non-current asset as held for sale. What is the criteria? An asset should be held for sale immediately in present condition. Second one. Second one is a very, very important criteria. The sale is highly probable. When do you say that a sale is highly probable? Let's say one of the accountants in my organization, accountant, okay? CFO, there is a manager of uh, uh, finance and then there is an accountant very down in the hierarchy. The accountant believed that a particular asset is held for sale. He intends to sell that particular asset. Buyer came in, he said, sir, this asset is held for sale. Then the buyer first asked, do you have the authorization to sell this asset? You are just an accountant. So do you have the authorization of the board of directors to dispose this particular asset? Do you have the authorization of the CEO to sell this particular asset? So therefore, you need to understand for me to categorize an asset as held for sale, I cannot rely on the bottom tier or mid tier management. 
I have to rely upon the intention of the top tier management of their intention to sell. So that means the top tier of the management of the company is of an intention to dispose their set. Fine. The board of directors have made a resolution in their board meeting every quarter saying that this, these, these particular assets are held for sale. They did nothing after that. They just said that they are held for sale. First of all, how do you want a customer to know that that particular asset is held for sale? You have to advertise first. Without even posting an advertisement, if you simply say that it is held for sale, how can it be even possible? Let's say I hold that my asset is, my car is held for sale. I should communicate, right? I should either go to Cars24 or OLX Cars or I have to post an ad on OLX saying that, sir, my car is held for sale. Without having an intention to look out for the buyer, what is the point of even claiming that the asset is held for sale? It is simply to say that my asset is held for sale. Very good. What effort did you make? Did you make an effort to find a buyer first of all? When you did not make an effort to find a buyer, you cannot say that the sale is probable. How can the sale be highly probable when you haven't made enough efforts to find a buyer? New machine today a new car today is 20 lakhs. I said old car I used. I I used man. You know what I am? I use this car 25 lakhs sale price. Buy now. Who will buy? Who will buy first of all? Sir, I use the car, sir. I am VVIP of this entire country. So I use the car. If you take that particular car, then you will also get VVIP treatment. Will anyone buy? So that means the price at which the asset is marketed should be reasonable approximation of its fair value. Today in the market, the fair value of that car is 8 lakhs, not 20 lakhs anymore. So you will have to market the car at an approximation of the fair value at which the car can be sold on today's date. Then only you can say that the sale is highly probable. Sir, the sale will be completed, sir. For sure it will be completed. When it will be completed? Whenever the buyer comes, sir. Very good. Whenever I agree to the buyer's price, sir, when will that happen? You tell me one particular date. Whenever it is bound to happen, it will happen, sir. Not possible. You tell me one particular date and such date which you tell me should be within 12 months. Then only I will say that the sale is highly probable. What happens after 12 months? It is not probable. I am not, I don't even know whether I will be alive or not after 12 months. So right now, either the sale is highly probable or not, if I have to classify then that means that the sale should be completed within a period of 12 months. Management intends to sell this asset, sir, if they get 15 lakhs. If they don't get 15 lakhs, then they'll pull out from the uh, from their intention to sell. They'll continue to use it. Sir, my car on today's date, if I get 10 lakhs, I will sell. If I don't get 10 lakhs, I'll continue to use the asset until I actually receive 10 lakhs. That means there is a high probability that the management can change its intention to sell the asset and shall continue to use that particular asset if it does not meet certain thresholds. In such cases where the intention change of the management is likely to happen, it cannot be called that the sale is highly probable. So for me to call that the sale is highly probable, the conditions to be met are first one. The appropriate level of management is committed to the plan to sell the asset. I am committed to sell this particular asset. An active program has been initiated to identify a buyer for the product. Number three, the asset is marketed at a price at which it is highly reasonable with reference to its fair value. It is highly reasonable with reference to its fair value today. Number four. The sale is expected to be completed within a period of 12 months itself. And lastly, significant changes or withdrawal of the plan to dispose the asset is unlikely, is highly unlikely. That means very, very impossible or very next to impossible is what we can use in colloquial sense. Five conditions I told. First one, appropriate level of management has committed to the plan to sell the asset. Active program has been initiated to find a buyer to purchase that asset. 
Number three, I quoted a price which is very reasonable with reference to the fair value of the asset. The sale is expected to be completed within a period of 12 months and significant changes or withdrawal from the disposal plan is highly unlikely to occur. If these five conditions are satisfied, then you can say that the sale is highly probable. So two conditions which we put up for identifying an asset as held for sale. What are the two criteria? First one, that this asset is held for sale immediately in present condition. That means no more modifications to the asset. Near future cannot be considered. If it is vitally used in an ongoing process, then along with the order you are you are intending to sell the asset, then in such cases you can say that the sale is highly probable or the sorry the asset is held for sale immediately in present condition. I'll say that the sale is highly probable if those five conditions are met. However, there is one particular case. You are saying that the sale should be completed within a period of 12 months. What if? I am expecting that the sale is completed, should be completed within a period of 12 months. But what if? 12 months are completed, but I still did not dispose the asset. Should I still continue to classify the asset under India S105? I said this particular car is held for sale. Classified it, recognized it, measured it as per India S105. Next year, again the board met and now I see that the car is still there. The board asked me what happened. I said I could not sell the car. I expected that the sale will be completed within 12 months. But unfortunately today the car is still there. I could not sell the car. But I am still intending to sell the car within the next 12 months. Then in such cases, he says, you can continue to classify the asset as held for sale, even if the 12 months has already elapsed, if two conditions are satisfied. 12 months are over and the asset is still not disposed, but I am still classifying it as held for sale if, first of all, the delay which occurred is due to reasons which are beyond enterprise control. Sir, you said you hold it for sale in March, April lockdown, 12 months are over, still the Corona crisis is still existing. That is the reason why the sale has actually been stopped. The reason is not within my control. So therefore, in such cases, you can still continue to hold the asset as held for sale. Number two, there is sufficient evidence that the entity is still committed to sell. Just because it is more than 12 months, I don't withdraw from the plan to sell. I still have a strong intention to dispose the asset. So there is sufficient evidence that the entity still plans to sell the asset and is committed to, plan, to the plan of selling the asset. So I'm saying if an asset could not be sold within a span of 12 months, you can continue to classify it as held for sale under India's 105 if number one, the delay is due to reasons which are beyond the control of the enterprise. And number two, there is sufficient evidence that the enterprise is still committed to its plan of selling the asset. Clear? These are the two conditions held for sale immediately in present condition and sale is highly probable. If these two conditions are met, then a non-current asset can be classified as held for sale. Sometimes he uses a word disposal group. Look at here. First point, they are committed to a plan of selling the sale of an asset or a disposal group. What is a disposal group? Disposal group means something like a CGU. Something like a CGU, which we have seen under India's 36. Two or more asset put together have some productivity. Individually, if I sell, they don't have any use. So therefore, the management today intends to sell the asset as a group together itself. There are group of assets, two or more assets, which are expected or intended to be disposed or sold together in one transaction itself. They are in such a way that even the buyer will get benefited only if they are sold in that particular group. Individually, the assets no one will buy. So therefore, the enterprise intended to dispose the group or sell the, uh, uh, sorry, dispose the assets or sell the assets as one single transaction in a group of assets. Sometimes a liability can also be attributed to a disposal group. 
liability can be a part of a disposal yes if such liability is directly attributed to an asset within the disposal group that means i bought a car and the car has a loan on it and such loan is directly associated with that particular asset and my intention is to sell the car along with the loan i'm saying 20 lakh car 12 lakh loan you pay me 8 lakh sufficient so i will transfer you the car i'll also transfer you the loan in such cases a liability can also be a part of a disposal group a liability can be attributed to a disposal group if it is directly related to the asset within the group and the entity intends to transfer the liability along with the asset here an asset held for exchange i my intention is i don't want to use this car i want to buy a new car management has taken a decision top tier management taken a decision i go to the showroom i'll give off this car and i will take a new car exchange of assets no disposal here it is exchange exchange can i still classify it as non current asset held for sale answer is yes this car i am no longer using it put it aside buy a new car sir what about this car i leave it man leave it in that lot in that parking lot no one wants to use the asset anymore we will sell it at a later point of time this is called as abandonment of asset abandoning the asset cannot be classified as held for sale because your intention is not to dispose the asset but your intention is to leave the asset from active use so in such case of abandonment the asset cannot be classified as held for sale clear now we'll go into the measurement of assets when they are classified as held for sale under indias 105 measurement measurement of an asset once it gets classified into india's 105 as held for sale earlier my measurement was based on india 16 india 38 or india 40 these were non current assets earlier classified under either of these three categories you were measuring them either on cost approach or revaluation approach if it was india 16 or 40, uh, 38 if it was 40 then i was carrying under cost approach but now, once you classify the asset as non-current asset held for sale, you cannot continue the same treatment that you followed under India 16, 38 or 40. Now what you are supposed to do? Now you are supposed to change the measurement scheme. How do you measure it now? I will measure an asset which is classified as held for sale on the day when it is classified as India 105 at lower of its carrying value or the fair value less cost to cost to sell guys fair value less cost to sell again the same logic of india's 36 when we call it as net selling price same thing again carrying value or fair value less cost of disposal should be the valuation at which i will measure the asset once the asset is classified as held for sale clear now what if what if your carrying value is less than the fair value of a uh, fair value less cost of disposal what will happen? No change in the value. The asset will be continued at the same book value. But if the fair value minus cost to sell is less than the carrying value, then I'll have to write down the asset. 
today the assets carrying value is 70 my intention is i can dispose the asset at 60 rupees by incurring a cost of 5 rupees that means my fair value less cost to sell my net selling price is 55 from that particular asset so 70 rupees carrying value 55 rupees is fair value less cost of disposal that means the asset should be measured at 55 rupees only so my 70 rupees asset has to be written down to 55 that means there is a difference of 15 rupees arising which is a loss in value of asset or decrease in the value of asset such a reduction in the value of asset on the date of classification of an asset into India's 105 should be charged to PNL. My board of directors met at the end of Q2. Q2 ended on 30th of September. On 20th of October, board of directors have held a meeting. On 20th of October, they have identified a particular asset and they said, this asset is held for disposal. All conditions satisfied. The asset should now be classified under India's 105 which was in day 16 earlier. So what are we supposed to do now? Now that, that means on that particular day, when you have classified it as held for, the, held for disposal or held for sale, I will have to write down the asset to 55 from 70 rupees. That balance of 15 rupees or the difference of 15 rupees should be straightforward charged off to p and Here. Let's say a balance sheet date has arised. 31st March, I still hold that asset for disposal. I have taken a decision on 20th October. I have classified it as held for sale. 15 rupees I already charged off to p and 31st March occurred now. 6 months already almost over. The asset is still held for sale. It is there with me. My intention is to dispose the asset only. But however, I will have to measure the fair value minus cost of disposal on each balance sheet date. Earlier, I thought fair value minus cost of disposal would be 55. But now for some reason, I understood that the fair value less cost of disposal can't even be 55. Maximum, I could collect 50 rupees. 15 already charged to PNL on 20th of October when you classified the asset as held for sale. On balance sheet date, now your fair value less cost to sell has decreased even more and you are expecting only 50 rupees to be collected. The asset is carried at 55. Now you will have to reduce it to 50. Another 5 rupees I will charge to the debit of PNL. But let's say for suppose there is an increase in fair value. There earlier I thought only 55 rupees I will get from the value of the asset if I sell the asset. But now I realized that I won't get 55 but instead I will get 65. Fantastic. 10 rupees increase in fair value less cost of disposal. Now how will I recognize it such increase in fair value of asset should be credited to the p and l that means from 55 to 65 the 10 rupees of increase i will credit to the p and l on the balance sheet date very good what if instead of 65 i expect today that i will get 75 rupees that means the increase is 20 rupees can i credit the entire 20 into the p and l no, because he says that I will credit the PNL for increase in fair value only to the extent it was debited earlier. On 20th October, when I classified the asset as held for disposal, I charged to PNL 15 rupees. Today, how much can I credit to PNL? Maximum 15 rupees. Sir, I am expecting to collect 75. No problem. You only recognize the asset at the value of 70. Because your measurement criteria still remains the same, lower of carrying value or fair value less cost of disposal. Your carrying value was 70, fair value less cost of disposal today is 75. So I have to measure the asset at 70 rupees only. So if I measure the asset at 70, that 15 rupees which was earlier debited to PNL, now I will credit to PNL. So whenever there is an increase in fair value of an asset, you credit the PNL to the extent. You have debited the PNL earlier. Clear? When the asset was earlier classified under India 16 or 38 or 40, you kept on charging depreciation on these assets. But once the asset, which was earlier classified as 16, 38 or 40, property, plan and equipment, intangible asset or investment property, 
now classified as held for sale under India S105, you need not charge depreciation. The depreciation expected to be charged each year on the asset will cease once the asset gets classified as held for sale. Now question will be, sir, I classified it as held for sale only at the end of second quarter, no? Should I charge depreciation for the first two quarters? Answer is yes. I will charge depreciation on an asset up to the date on which it got classified as in days 105. Here, until the asset is classified as in days 105, I will charge depreciation. My depreciation on the asset should cease, should stop. Once the asset get classified as held for sale, and started recognition under India S105. Clear? This is the concept of measurement and recognition of an asset by when they get classified under India S105 as non current assets held for sale. Guys, if you have a disposal beyond 12 months, that means I am expecting that the disposal of the asset could take a period beyond 12 months. Reasons? Because of the nature of the asset is like that. It is customary to the nature of the asset and the process of sale that it could extend beyond 12 months. Then in such case, you can continue to classify it as held for sale. We have given it above. What did we say? We said if the delay in sale can be ignored in classifying the asset as held for sale, if the terms and conditions are customary to the process of sale, that means if there are, if the, if the delay is customary to the nature of the asset, or the process of sale, then you can ignore this time period of 12 months. However, in such case, measurement change is also necessary because the cost of disposal, which you are reducing from fair value, at the time when you classify the asset as held for sale, that cost of disposal should now be measured at its present value. So it will be fair value on sale minus present value of cost of disposal. So cost of disposal should be discounted at present value and finance cost should be recognized on cost of disposal each year until the expected disposal. We have seen how finance cost is recognized uh, yesterday when we were talking about in day 16 regarding decommissioning liability where I kept on charging finance cost or interest cost each year. Same way this uh, disposal cost which is discounted to its present value should keep on adding with the amount of interest every year until the expected disposal. That will bring us to the end of the first concept of India's 105 where we discussed about non-current asset held for sale. Now let's step into the next concept that is discontinued operation. Like I told you, significant difference from what AS24 said. Significant difference. Why significant difference? Because AS24 application started once I take a decision to discontinue an operation. Because AS24 language is discontinuing operation. Discontinuing means over the period of discontinuance, the necessary disclosures to be given were discussed under AS24. Here under India S105, I am not talking about discontinuing operation, but I am talking about discontinued operation so automatically the scope of standard became very small over the period of discontinuance there is no disclosures necessary so the standard has cut to size cut to size because of the change in scope so when do you classify an asset as discontinued operation when a component of an asset is either disposed of or it is classified as held for sale now, what is this component first of all? What do you mean by component of an enterprise? Mobile phone, what is the components of a mobile phone? Screen, battery, operating software, all these are basically different components. So when I say component of an enterprise, it is a part of the enterprise. It is a part of the enterprise. What part should be considered as component under India's 105? A component of an enterprise is a part of an enterprise which represents a separate major line of business or a geographical operation. I am Ramraj Cotton Singh. Okay. 
Ramraj Cottons is my enterprise. We are into selling lungis. And uh, I established my network or chain of retail stores across the country. Across the country. When I started expanding, I expanded, 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 and I went into Kashmir also, where I put up in Srinagar my plant of my uh, retail store of Ramraj Khan. Now, immediately, one learned man came down and he said, Sir, the temperature in Srinagar does not suit your lungi by any chance. Therefore, please shut down your geographical area of operation from North India. So, what happened there? So he pulled out from North India and he said, yes, I am closing this geographical location. It represents a separate major geographical location, separate major line of business. Men clothing, women clothing are very famous example. Men clothing, same t-shirt I wore in winter, same t-shirt I'll wear in summer, same t-shirt I'll wear in rainy season also. Zero shame for men. We will wear same clothing here. For us, there is no change in winter clothing separate, your summer clothing separate, same thing. For us, a short, shorts are basically purposefully used for 365 days a year. We don't really find any uh, absurdity when we say that in a winter season, you are still wearing shorts. Shorts make me feel comfortable is what we say. Men garment is zero profit industry men. Zero profit. First of all, we are one fashion disaster. Right? We don't have sense of clothing by any chance. Second thing, we don't intend to buy. For us, buying means once in a year, we'll buy and we'll come back. Shopping is not a passion to us. Shopping is an urgency to us. So because you don't have clothes, you go and buy. Not because you fancy it. For women, it is different. They have a fancy. Now let's go to shop. That's a plan for me. It's a plan. It's like, uh, let's go to uh, Maldives is a big plan. Shopping is also a big plan. For so that is a passion. So, men clothing, women clothing, both I started. I kept on running for three years. Now I understood men clothing useless to run this operation. So I said, shut down men clothing, continue only women clothing, enough. So what happened now? I shut down a major line of business itself. A major line of business itself I shut down. I am into making special structures of steel. I had my own galvanizing plant. But the galvanizing plant was not even used at 30% capacity. What is the point? I disposed of the galvanizing plant and my galvanization today, I will do it outside. So what is happening? A line of business has been disposed. Clear? So a component of a business is a one which represents a separate line of business or separate major line of business or geographical location. The intention of the management is to dispose this separate line of business or geographical operation in one single transaction. One single transaction, close everything and come out. Third one, I have acquired a subsidiary with an intention to dispose of in near future. So that means my intention to buy the shares of that particular company is so that there I will get some capital gain when I sell it. But unfortunately, buying, buying, buying those shares, I crossed up 50%, it became subsidiary. So in such cases, it is a subsidiary, which has been acquired with an intention of immediate sale. In such cases, consolidation does not apply. Here, we have to classify it as India's 105. Here, so a component of an enterprise, which is either disposed of, that means sold off, or is being classified as held for sale, should be considered as discontinuing opera, discontinued operation. What is a component? A component of an enterprise represents a separate major line of business or a geographical location which I intend to dispose in one single transaction or it is a subsidiary which is acquired with an intention of disposing in immediately. Clear? Now, to meet the criteria of a component, to meet the criteria of the word component, it should be distinguished operationally and for financial reporting purpose. When do I say that a component is distinguished operationally and for financial reporting purpose? This condition can be satisfied 
if this condition can be satisfied if the management believes that the cost of that uh, the revenues of that particular component can be identified separately majority of the cost in that particular component can be identified separately for financial reporting purposes for my reporting purposes i call that as a separate operating segment under index 108 then you can say that it is distinguished operationally and for financial reporting purpose i can attribute revenues to it i can directly attribute major majority of cost to it then you can say that that particular component is distinguished for reporting purposes and operationally as well this is my discussion regarding discontinued operation but i will close this standard after one single statement regarding withdrawal of a disposal plan i plan to dispose individual asset or a group of assets or a component of an enterprise either of these i plan under index 105 disposal can be for one single asset or disposal group or for a component of an enterprise either of these three can be classified as held for sale but now on today's date for some reason the management out of nowhere has withdrawn its plan of disposal first thing you need to do is to give a reason give a reason disclose a reason why you withdrew from the plan sir when i wanted to dispose when i took a decision to dispose you did not ask me reason why why are you asking me a reason now then my wish i wanted to dispose i classified it as helpful sale today i am withdrawing my wish absolutely no the standard never asks you to disclose a reason on why you want to dispose a particular asset or a disposal group or a component but if you plan to this to withdraw from your disposal if you plan to withdraw from your disposal you should have a reason and such a reason for withdrawal should be disclosed by the enterprise in its financial statements clear now whether that reason is such, uh, sufficient or not no one can decide management will give whatever reason they feel like okay but compulsory reason should be disclosed whenever i withdraw until then i have been recognizing or measuring the asset at carrying value or fair value less cost of disposal whichever is lower now i withdrew from the plan now i have withdrawn from the plan now what should i do i'll have to recognize the asset at the cost of the asset or carrying value of the asset on the date on which it was classified as disposal minus the depreciation which should have been charged but you did not charge because when you classified into india's 105 you don't you don't charge depreciation so carrying cost of the asset on the date of classification as disposal less depreciation that would have been recognized if the asset is not classified as held for sale here what did you say depreciation should cease very good on that day what was the carrying value of the asset minus the depreciation which i should have charged but i did not charge because i classified the asset as index 105 so such depreciation should be reduced from the carrying value of the asset on the date of classification as held for sale or the recoverable value of the asset on the date of reclassification whichever is lower what is the recoverable value higher of value in use or net selling price your index 36 definition this concept of recoverable value we have discussed under index 36 it is higher of value in use or net selling price whichever is higher so either the cost of the asset on the date of classification into into disposal minus the depreciation that should have been charged but was not charged up to the date of reclassification or the recoverable value on the date of reclassification whichever is lower should be the value of the asset at which it is recognized clear however i told you asset should the enterprise should disclose the reason why you withdrew from the plan of disposal clear 
that will bring us to the end of discussions on the standard in days 105.